Hey, it's Krishna here, and welcome back to another episode of Demystifying Medicine. This is the podcast that helps you understand the science when and where you want it. So by now, we have all, in one way or another, been affected by COVID-19, whether you were a family member had contact with it or, you know, you've been feeling the impacts of it economically. There's really no escaping this reality. When the virus first started to spread over the globe, we were told to be aware of the following symptoms, coughing, fever, difficulty breathing, chills, and fatigue. Even now, we're constantly on the lookout for these symptoms, but recently, We're seeing new information come to light where people around the world are reporting a variety of long lasting symptoms. Ed Young says this in one of his articles that I really, really liked. Um, Basically COVID for for most people is mild and it kills a few, except every day there's new information coming out and we see that it's much more than just mild. Even those who quote unquote recover from COVID don't really end up recovering, at least not several months down the line. Beyond the respiratory symptoms, people are reporting attention and memory loss, headaches, disturbed consciousness, and a variety of other neurological symptoms. Today, we have Dr. John Conley here with us, a professor of linguistics and languages at McMaster University and the Senator William McMaster Chair in the Cognitive Neuroscience of Language. Dr. Conley is the founding director of Aerial Research Center, and he is co-director of the Language, Memory, and Brain Lab. In 2017, Dr. Conley co-founded Box Neuro, a neurotech startup. He has also done research on the long-lasting neurological symptoms associated with COVID-19. We're excited to have you here speak to have you here with us and speak more about it. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Conley. It's a pleasure. Um, why don't you start off by you know telling us a bit more about your research and what you and your team are doing? Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, so it's a lab that concentrates on a variety of brain recording and brain imaging tools to study cognition. That's uh, I've been doing that work since the early 1990s. Wow. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I used to lie saying I was 10 years old at the time, but <laughs> I'll just pass on that. Uh, and we found that at least an awful lot of what we're looking at, the best measure that, for us to use is the oldest one. Uh, it's called electroencephalography, and in particular, uh, a type of response from that response called event-related potentials or evoked potentials. And uh, so what we've been doing, like I say, we started off uh, doing this work in the early 90s, looking at patients who had sustained uh, acquired, uh, some type of acquired brain injury. The first few people we saw were catastrophic uh, traumatic brain injuries. And they were left in what uh, is still called by many a vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome condition. And what that really meant was that the general perception of them was that they were no longer really there, uh, but their body was still able to sustain life. And we tested the first patient in 1991 and demonstrated that actually the diagnosis was wrong that the person was cognitively there, and we used electroencephalography, in particular these evoked potentials, to demonstrate that. And uh, very briefly, what we did was we looked at the type of response that is sensitive to semantic comprehension of speech, uh, and, and also reading. It started off, the, the initial work was done in reading, and it translates uh, very nicely to speech. And uh, it demonstrates a person's recognition that something that was said doesn't make sense. It's that simple. And uh, we tested this young fellow who had sustained a traumatic brain injury, and he showed this response, which he really should not have done if the diagnosis of vegetative state was correct. He then received treatment, which was not on his schedule. There, he was about to be sent to triage, which is palliative care, uh, and which is, as the physiatrist said, fundamentally a death sentence. And it said he received treatment and about six, I really do forget, but it's about six to nine months later, he walked out of the hospital with a temporary and unnecessary, but precautionary um, multi-point cane. It just gave him increased stability. And he went back home to where he he was living. And uh, aside from never speaking again, that was the nature of the the localization of his injury. uh, He made a full recovery. And that really inspired us to really pursue what we were doing, which was to use 
these measures uh, to study cognition uh, and all its variants in terms of uh, things that go wrong with the brain. So that's really how it started. Mm -hmm. So um, you do mention electroencephalography. Um, for the people that might be listening and don't really know what that is, in other words, an EEG, can you kind of describe what the technology is and what it does? Sure. The technology is non-invasive, non-painful, it's an easy. Uh, it, it is basically you either wear a, what looks like a bathing cap, like okay. a swimming cap. Uh, it, it has sensors or elect electrodes in, in the cap, and they record your brain electrical activity. So uh, it is like recording someone's heart rate, except it's the brain's response to just existing. So even if you're doing nothing, if you're just told to sit still and just, just sit there, uh, you will show brain electrical activity. Uh, sleep studies, when, you, when somebody might read about sleep studies that are looking to try to help people who have trouble sleeping, so even when you're sleeping, your brain activity is, is, is profound. It goes through different stages. It's very elaborate. Uh, you can tell when someone's dreaming. That's actually from rapid eye movements, but uh, you can see changes in the EEG. And also, I think for our purposes, what really is, matters about it is that it is easy to do. It is really not intrusive on the person. There are no exclusions to who can be tested. And what I mean by that is when we do MRI, there are some people that cannot get into the magnet for a whole variety of, of uh, psychological reasons. They, they get claustrophobic or, or real physical reasons, uh, some types of pacemakers, uh, any sort of metal, uh, ferrous metal uh, that they may have in them, some type of splint. Uh, that, that will be a problem in the magnet. And I think the big plus of uh, evoked potentials, a certain type of evoked potentials, is that there are a range of different types of what are called components. And they are over, over decades, uh, up in some cases up to almost 70 years of research, have, has demonstrated that some of these components are really quite specific to very specific cognitive functions, like semantic comprehension, uh, memory, different types of memory, very subtle types of memory, uh, the ability to pay attention, the ability to concentrate, and that makes these types of measures quite unique in the brain recording world. So uh, it, it's really quite a valuable tool. So um, what kind of neurological complications have you seen, uh, you know, doing your work with this uh, technology and Advox Neuro? What kind of neurological complications have you guys seen that have been caused by COVID-19? Uh, by, okay, by COVID-19, we have seen uh, a range of them we and i should say this is work that's just begun <clears throat> excuse me it has just begun and it uh, we have seen problems with attention it is what people describe i think let me back up people describe their symptoms and quite accurately the the problem both in canada the us and the united kingdom have three places i've been paying very close attention to they have had trouble, if I can put it this way, just getting credibility with some of the medical community that they've seen. Now, in a lot of cases, the medical community was dealing with acute COVID, and uh, they, that was a, a case in some many of these cases of, of sustaining life. Uh, but the post-COVID syndrome in particular uh, has now started to get some credibility because it's so common. And uh, so the problems we've seen there, aside from some of these patients never having been hospitalized, never having been formally diagnosed until after the fact, they are now being seen by some physicians who are more sensitive to the patients, if I can put it that way, uh, that they, they don't just say, oh, it'll, it'll pass, go away. Some of these people have been suffering from these symptoms. So it's post-acute illness and it's symptoms that even 10, 11 months later, have not gone away. Uh, so it is, and they, the thing is that some of these symptoms wax and wane so that it will seem as if it's gone away or one particular type of problem that they're suffering from has gone away and it will come back for no apparent reason. So, and what we've seen, uh, the first one that everyone, everyone always mentions is uh, memory. 
that they have substantial problems with memory. Some have described it as, as not, it's never really long-term memory. It is, it is more like short-term memory, which then starts to get into issues of the ability to attend to something or concentrate on something. So if you just think of yourselves as uh, studying uh, some things by the time you finish in whatever profession you're in, they're in your long-term memory. So you will not struggle with it, but you will remember to your introductory biology course, how you just really struggle to remember exactly what mitochondria did. Uh, and at some point it'll just be a second nature to you if you stay in this business. So it's not the long term, it's the learning process that seems to be interfered with. This was noted very early on in some of the Italian uh, neurology assessments. And uh, so memory, uh, concentration, and the ability to pay attention at all, let alone to concentrate on something, uh, that's been reported. And something that has been seen from the very earliest studies out of China and Italy in particular, and that is what they call disexecutive syndrome. And this is where a lot of these functions, these cognitive functions come together to enable you to do a range of things in your daily life, like attend this meeting. Remember that you have to attend this meeting. So it breaks down on everyone. Um, and uh, and it, it involves attention, concentration, memory, planning. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a frontal lobe issue. That's where it's driven from, or it, that's, that's a, a meeting place for all these different functions to enable you to do what's called executive functioning. And a lot of patients just describe, I'm no longer able to do certain things. And again, uh, people in Italy and China in January of last year, February of last year, we're saying this, this we're seeing. So it, it is a range of these and we're seeing now the manifestations of those when we do our measurements. Um, so uh, I just want, you mentioned frontal lobe as one of the affected areas, uh, especially tied to memory loss, right? But do we know anything about how COVID or, you know, COVID-2 might be affecting these neurological um, components of ours? The quick answer is no. <laughs> uh, I, I think it, it is still, I, I went to a, a, a talk, a, sort of a private talk that, uh, that Dr. Fauci, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, it's okay, let me just try to get rid of that, there we go, that Dr. Fauci uh, gave uh, uh, down in the States, and and he said, I'll be saying no, no, a lot, uh, because we still don't know. We know, we think we know, that it enters the brain uh, through a variety of mechanisms, that's the thing, there, there's good evidence for blood brain barrier changes associated with COVID, Mm -hmm. uh, and so that it infiltrates the brain that way. Uh, cranial nerves, especially uh, one in five, are large suspects of how it enters the brain. And we know from work done years ago with other types of coronaviruses that uh, they absolutely entered the brain that way. Uh, it's, all, it's also why some of the early symptoms include headache and loss of taste and smell. So those are cranial nerves one in, and five. and these are areas where it, if it comes in that way, in fact, there are some, so that's, that's one mechanism of getting in. In terms of actually how they exercise influence on cognition, I think it is, it is not so much targeting cognition per se, they're hitting brain areas that cognition depends on. And uh, in fact, there is even some work with other types of viruses, inv neuroinvasive viruses, that suggests that some of the, in them, it remains to be seen with uh, COVID. I think it maybe isn't the case with COVID, but in some other viruses like COVID, that, uh, that the respiratory problems, so the breathing and the, uh, the inability to take deep breaths, et cetera, that that is actually secondary to the neuroinvasive features because it, it's been suggested in other work, other viruses, that uh, it enters the brain and immediately heads toward one particular structure called the medulla. And the medulla is very influential in controlling respiration. And then once it's there, it moves on. Uh, it's, it's a very opportunistic 
virus, not just the variants there. That's a whole other issue. But it, it really goes off. To, it's why the symptoms are so complex. It goes off to, it seems as if what it can find that's weak. So uh, at any rate, we don't know the exact mechanisms of influencing these things. And what we've seen is that there are some patients, and I will emphasize again that we've just started this work, so it's very small samples. We are looking for profiles, but it's far too early to do that. But we are seeing some people where, where some of their cognitive functions are really quite intact, but others are very, very much affected. So there may be variants of this in terms of what gets affected, but why that is, again, we just don't know. So a lot of people end up losing their sense of smell or their sense of taste. Would you say that's more of the um, virus affecting its, affecting the, the person on the outside of the body versus like the neurological inside? No, I think it's still neurological. That's the way it's described. Also, I'm glad you mentioned this because I, I meant to go back to this point. We're talking about cognition a lot simply because that's primarily where I work. But uh, there, there are very clear uh, motor effects. So uh, people losing their balance, uh, just becoming clumsy so that uh, if they will reach for something and knock other things over even though that was never a problem they had before. So the neurological consequences really range from very, very fundamental to inflammation, uh, delirium, uh, for example, but then they extend to really quite, certainly in the post-COVID stage, uh, which includes the balance issues and, and just ambulation. There are people who really trip and fall and there is no, they look back, they do the classic of, Looking back at the sidewalk, there's no reason that they should have stumbled and, and fallen. And uh, there was a CNN uh, person that described that in terms of his symptoms. Whereas a journalist uh, out in Vancouver was interviewed by CBC. She's a journalist and she said she struggled to compose sentences. So the thing that she had been doing for decades for a living, she really couldn't do and, and it was not fatigue it was not an unwillingness she couldn't put the words together in a way that worked for her so i think there are really a wide range of uh, neurologically based symptoms here so your um the work that you and your team are doing how how does that really help the individual coming to you you know, in the future and help them get that treatment that they really need? An excellent question. And it's it's one of those things of things don't always work in, in coordinated fashion. Um, so that what we're doing, first of all, is, and that's why they came to us, we're giving them what they hope is and what our experience is, credible demonstrations that they are not just anxious and they should not be told to go home and it'll sort itself out after a while. They have a neurological consequence of this virus and it's affecting large areas of their cognitive domain. And, uh, and when I say areas, I don't mean neuroanatomical, I just mean domains of cognitive function. It is neurological in terms of neuroanatomical, but we're still working on exactly where. But inflammation is a major feature here. So right now, treatment for them, I think, again, everyone is trying to figure out what would be best. And I think a lot of neuropsychological-based uh, rehabilitation processes of cognitive therapy is what people are working at uh, all over the world. I've got a colleague in Ghana, in Africa, uh, who is is a first-rate neuropsychologist, and he, that's where he's going because he said it's the first place to to try to see if things that we've done for different types of brain injury will apply here as well. So, uh, and so uh, right now, all we're doing is is really trying to better define brain fog because brain fog doesn't really carry a great deal of useful information for a would-be healthcare provider. So we're just outlining where. Are these problems? Is it memory? Is it attention? Is it both? 
uh, and then they can take it from there. So we're doing this work at a range of different clinics in Southern Ontario. Uh, and uh, we're about to move into the U.S. to do the same thing. So, uh, so yeah, that's what we're doing within the company that you mentioned, Box Nero. Yeah. Um, so, in your opinion, out of everything you've seen, out of all the research you've done, all the results you've seen, what was the most eye-opening results that you know that you've come across? As regards COVID-19, you mean? Yeah, in particular yeah. related to COVID-19 and the yeah. individuals suffering from them. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it was the extent of the, the brain measures that we use are really that, they're brain measures. So it's not subjective opinion. It's not that I interview you and you say you have terrible headaches. Uh, so I can see two of you right now and you may not, you might describe a terrible headache. And if I say, if I ask you on a scale from one to 10, you might say, oh, this is a, this is a nine. And, and the other person that I can see uh, might say, it's a, it's a six. It might, what does that tell me? It, it is your subjective opinion. You may have different thresholds of pain sensitivity. Then I have to make an interpretation. So now it becomes even more remote from what really may be going on. So the measures we take of things like memory and attention that you might say, I just can't concentrate on things. We can do tests to really evaluate objectively what is your brain capacity for attending to these stimuli that we present to you. We, we, we push the brain to do something. It's not passive. So we make you work so to speak, with your brain to do these sorts of assignments we give you. And we look to see how is it responding in comparison to someone of your age, your sex, your, your education, a whole range of characteristics. I think education really doesn't factor in here. But nonetheless, uh, we have a big database. And if we say this person is 21 and is not performing like a 21-year-old, uh, we're, we're calculating, looking at brain measures and calculating, a, 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 if you like, a brain age function. And uh, we might see someone at 21 that looks to be 75 in terms of the way their brain is functioning. So what surprised me in all of this was we were testing people that ranged from, I think, the youngest was about 20. And I think so far the oldest has been still fairly young, at least by my definition, uh, in the early 50s. And they really did not look good at all. I wouldn't even want to classify them in terms of age. It looked really quite pathological that they, they were not able to attend to very simple stimuli. And uh, they could follow the instructions of pressing buttons when they heard a certain type of tone, for example. They could do that but it's just the brain response to it was was really quite a great deal smaller than it should have been. And another characteristic is very much later than it should have been. And so, so this was all in after they had COVID, I'm assuming, right? It was, this is all post acute infection. Okay. They have apparently, they're no longer infected, but mm -hmm. it's that the this symptomatology just won't go away. And to give you an idea of, of prevalence uh, studies from the United Kingdom. I'm thinking of one paper in, in particular by uh, Dr. Elaine Maxwell at the National Institute for Health Research. And she said that uh, up to 50% of the COVID people that she saw post-infection, uh, again, some of whom had never even been diagnosed, but when as she looked at this, she said at least 50% will need formal rehabilitation to hope to get back to where they were pre-COVID. So this is really quite a serious neurological insult that is being discussed here. And I was surprised how our data showed it so clearly. And it was also just uh, disturbing to see how much some of these responses were suppressed. So. Yeah, um, that it's really interesting because something that Elaine Maxwell says in a formal research paper, there's a whole community out there who are struggling post-COVID to really adapt to 
a whole new way of life almost. Yes. And in social media, there's so many people that talk about having lost their sense of taste and not, you know, getting it back months, months down the road. And it's not talked about as often. No. Even Ed Young says this in his article about long haulers. They have to make their own support groups. They have to make, they have to find their own, you know, um, their own evidence for feeling the way that they are. Yeah, it is. It, it's, I think, I think the world was preoccupied understandably with the acute mm-hmm. COVID. It was running rampant in some countries. It was, it was really terrifying. And uh, when one says a few, well, the few right now, uh, first of all, uh, it is not a few. It is tens of millions of people yeah. uh, have been infected. In fact, the numbers are finally now, the real truth is coming out uh, that the numbers, even several months ago, by those really working in the field, for example, someone that I again attended a talk uh, in by distance, but like this Zoom uh, that he gave, and he's based in Boston, and, but he's an epidemiologist and he's head of, of global viruses uh, at the Mass General. And he said that uh, the current estimate then, several months and months ago, this is, I really forget, I've lost sense of time during this pandemic, but uh, four months ago, at least, uh, was over 1 billion uh, cases. So it's, it, it's only, the Johns Hopkins is a very good measure, but it's only for those who have formally been diagnosed. Right. So, and there's, for every one of them, it's, it's a, a multiple of people who actually have the virus. So this is, the long-term effects is, is going to be the next pandemic in a sense. Um, so if our listeners were to take one thing away from you know, our talk today, what would you want it to be? to be very careful <laughs> do not <laughs> do not get the virus but but seriously if you if someone says oh it'll go away if it's if you now feel better but you did have the virus you're certain of it or else you were formally diagnosed with it or tested for it and someone says oh it'll go away don't trust that go see someone say i think i've been suffering with this for 2 months i don't i'm not having the acute effects any longer, what can I do? Well, really seek out help because it, it, it will not necessarily go away. I think this long COVID is far more prevalent uh, than people are recognizing. And you can try to cope. I mean, I sympathize with people that just keep trying to cope. You should do that. Rehab is as much on the patient as it is on the healthcare provider. But I think it's really essential they seek help yeah so thank you for joining us here today dr Conley. that was our final question we really enjoyed this talk and you know for all you listeners please be aware of you know everything in the world that's going on you might not know what's going on with your own body but sometimes you are your own best advocate for medical care so listen to your gut and stay tuned for another episode of demystifying medicine next week bye guys Oh, 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 oh,